Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth event in our 2014-15 season, the Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good. We're delighted to have as our lecturer today, Alessandro Duranti, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and Dean of Social Sciences at UCLA. Dean Duranti will be properly introduced in just a few minutes, so please think of my brief comments here about his presentation, whose specific site eagerly await along with all of you as something like a small contextualizing hors d'oeuvre that what's your appetite for what's to come. His main title, How Disruptive Can We Be, could hardly announce the timeliness of his lecture more clearly. With respect to the public university, the idea of reform or progress um, by purposeful disruption seems all the rage these days. By this I mean that many individuals look eagerly to disruption as our best hope to save public education. But I also mean that there are very deep feelings about out there as well as you know, a, a deep concern and sometimes even, well, rage. Indeed, for every person who sees disruption as a golden road to the public university's salvation, there's probably at least one other who wonders, as William Butler Yeats did, what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. <laughs> the clash of different views, even sharply different views, can be a very healthy thing. Indeed, universities such as ours thrive on vigorous debate, and we leveraged it to advance our understanding and create solutions. But, and here I speak as an observer rather than a scholar of disruption, it seems to me that debates around this idea too often occur on an uneven playing field. Proposals for uh, dramatic, far-reaching, and powerfully transformative types of disruption of the higher ed status quo seem typically to find receptive and interested ears in the media, on Main Street, and even among many in academia. Take this to be a natural result of disruption's visionary appeal coupled with a widespread frustration over the seemingly intractable problems afflicting public education. In contrast, concerns, questions, or even calls for careful deliberation regarding a plan of disruption seem not to fare nearly so well. They're too often quickly dismissed as symptoms of some pathology, obsolete thinking, Luddite, fear of change, or self-interest. This evasion of critical thinking, I hardly need to point out, is antithetical to what universities such as UC Davis stand for and also serious lecture series such as the Provost Forum. We should all be wary whenever we see this argumentative approach being used and refuse to be silenced uh, by a fear of it being used against us. My point, which is perhaps obvious by now, is simply this. Purposeful and significant disruption of the status quo has the potential to be a very good thing, perhaps even a salvation. But it also has the very real potential to produce unforeseen circumstances or consequences that would make us all worse off than we are before. What is needed to help us make wise decisions about deploying disruption is a sort of rational, informed dialogue that Dean Duretti will introduce today. Before I leave the subject of today's program, let me remind you that all of you are invited to continue the discussion during the reception in, uh, out on the terrace immediately following our question period. Now a quick look ahead. Today's Provost Forum will be followed by just one more this academic year. On May 20th, Wendy Brown, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Berkeley APEC Study Center uh, will speak on the topic, the end of the corporate university, what we are now. Professor Brown is a passionate and brilliant speaker who thinks a great deal about the state of the public university, so I hope you'll be able to join us for that event as well. Details are available on my website and the flyer will be forthcoming. Please make sure all your friends know. So I want personally to thank today the Provost Forum Organizing Committee for their ongoing efforts and expertise in planning and arranging our events, the five campus entities that have joined my office to co-sponsor this event, Science and Technology Studies, the Institute for Social Sciences, the Center for Science and Innovation Studies, the Community and Regional Development Program, and the Center for Regional Change. Our moderator, Mario Biagioli, Distinguished Professor of Law and Science and Technology Studies here at UC Davis, and not least, our great thanks to Dean Durante for speaking with us today. Before inviting Professor Biagioli to introduce our speaker, I want to give a special shout out to Casey Castaldi, who is here for her last Provost Forum, 
For over a year, she has supported our efforts beautifully. She's been a great liaison between the provost's office and all the other offices that you need to make a series like this come forward. She's going to go off and work at a nonprofit, so the public sector. So let us thank Casey. <laughs> oh, you don't have to applaud, Casey. Thank you. So, Mario. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure uh, to uh, introduce our speaker today, um, Professor Alessandro Duranti, uh, who is a distinguished professor of anthropology and uh, dean of uh, uh, social sciences at uh, um, UCLA. Uh, professor Duranti is the author of at least uh, uh, six books, um, as well as a fellow of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and uh, a, a former um, Guggenheim Fellow. Um, he also happens to be uh, a very good friend. I, you know, at this point uh, in memory sometimes is not what it used to be, but I think I uh, first time met um, uh, Alessandro in the anthropology department at uh, UCLA when I noticed that in the, in at the back of the uh, lecture room there was an excellent espresso machine, uh, which at the time was not common, uh, and I saw that there was a guy who was working it, and, uh, and that was uh, um, um, Alessandro. Um, so, uh, Professor Duranti is a, a, you know, a linguistic anthropologist of, uh, I don't know many linguistic anthropologists, but something tells me that he's of a specific, uh, uh, a specific uh, kind of uh, uh, variety. That is, uh, his work can be uh, extremely technical. He can focus on, say, one sentence. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he looks at, you know, at these uh, uh, specific you know, utterances in the context of the interpersonal uh, interactions and also in the context of the use of uh, you know, uh, visual clues and, uh, uh, and, and other forms of visual information. So this has led uh, him to actually, of course, not only uh, rely on uh, you know, uh, audio recordings, but also um, uh, become a quite good uh, filmmaker in the process of uh, documenting uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of interaction, so he's a, a linguistic anthropologist that doubles uh, as a visual anthropologist, but also uh, as a kind of an anthropologist of music. Given that you know, uh, not only he's an excellent uh, uh, jazz guitar player, but in addition to that, uh, he also has studied musical rehearsal and performances uh, from uh, um, uh, you know f from a, a, an ethnographic. Uh, um, uh, point of view. Um, so, for somebody whose uh, current uh, job description uh, requires, uh, you know, managing lots of people at, at a fairly uh, large uh, scale, um, it is, you know, it's kind of interesting that you know his uh, uh, research skills are apparently at the other end of the spectrum. That is, at this very kind of microscopic level. At the same time, if you read any of his work, and um, the one that I, I, I found fascinating was uh, from uh, Grammar to Politics. So this is a book uh, based on field work in, uh, in Samoa, where Alessandro shows how in the context of political like community uh, uh, meetings that are meant by some people to kind of destabilize the village order and uh, in, you know, introduce a new kind of order, Often, the political signals and, and, and the attempts to disrupt is coded in grammar. So it's, it's the use of certain grammatical forms that signal uh, certain, uh, certain uh, uh, you know, tactics. And it shows how people effectively, the successful uh, leaders, those who can kind of rescramble uh, the village hierarchy, do that by kind of playing with the grammar. So it's, it's kind of by scrambling the language that they manage to scramble the village and then reassemble it in a way uh, that uh, they like. So I suspect that this uh, uh, micro uh, approach to political uh, uh, scenarios probably comes in very handy as a dean. 
Uh, and, you know, uh, you know, Sandro has the really an, an amazing ability to uh, detect and read meaning into um, really kind of fragmentary moves and utterances. So I'm positive that the way you will ask him questions, he will immediately kind of make uh, a, an identikit of who you are and, and so on. Um, he has written, uh, you know, important pieces. He has thought a lot and he has written important pieces on uh, the future of the university and sometimes the future of specific disciplines like uh, um, uh, like uh, um, anthropology. And uh, you know, to give you an example of this, uh, this uh, kind of how the attention to detail, you know, actually, you know, gives you an entry point into bigger uh, pictures. In a recent interview um, about the future of the university, the, the journalist asked um, Alessandro, so uh, when you think about the university 30 years from now, what, uh, uh, what is the question? What are you most curious about? And he responded, uh, who knows what the students will have in their backpacks? Okay. So, <laughs> um, so the, um, there was something else that uh, I wanted uh, to mention, but uh, um, I think uh, it is, uh, um, it's gone somewhere in the, the mushy neurons. Uh, um, it is a pleasure to have Alessandro Duranti here to talk about how disruptive uh, we, uh, can we be. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very nice introduction, uh, Mario, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I actually have two mics, so I will, I'm not gonna be here the whole time. But now, for a moment, I'm going to be here. Uh, I just also wanted to thank uh, Provost uh, Ralph Hexter for uh, this idea, first of all, of the, of the forum. I think it's an excellent idea. And I saw the, the other titles, and they're all very impressive and a little slightly intimidating. But I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, and also Martin Kenny, who, uh, with whom I had a conversation on the phone that convinced him that maybe I should come up. And I'm delighted to, uh, to be here. Um, and so I, um, by the way, scramble the language. I think I'm, I'm going to use that. In fact, there's even a video of you talking about my book, which I should use someplace. It's, it was a great summary of what I do. So, okay, I decided the following, that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some examples. So, um, as you know, uh, disruptive and disruption has been used a lot in the business world, and then this has become also a word uh, as a metaphor and not metaphor that's been used in academia, so I'm going to get into it. So in case I never get to the end, I've learned this after years and years of taking tangents and you never know whether I'm going to get back to where I belong. Uh, here's the, the, the way I've organized uh, the talk. So first, on uh, the first part, uh, I'm going to do a brief review of issues in higher education you're going to be familiar with, but just to get back to where we started, and some of them are on the website actually for this series. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about where, uh, where we get our knowledge and inspiration, and inspiration when we have jobs, responsibility like your provost or your, your deans and, and, and chairs and other people who get, you know, take this job of, of actually having, that has a different kind of description of actually the job, academic jobs that we were originally hired for most of the time. Then I'm going to talk about this concept that I just made up this morning at the airport which is called sideways disruption. So the, the idea actually is something I've been thinking about for a long time, but just trying out a uh, possible uh, word or, or, or metaphor, and this idea that it, as a way of characterizing the, the, these uh, activities and practices, initiatives that I've been working on over the last five years uh, as a disruption uh, at, uh, on the ed at the edges, basically. And the, the fourth part is a, the, the shorter part, which is, which is the part where I'm going to just summarize a little bit of the main points, and then we'll hopefully we'll have, a, we'll have a discussion. So the first one, I t talk a little bit about higher education uh, in the 21st century, the, the, uh, which is the topic of, your, uh, of, this, of this series here. And, and here, uh, I took this from the website, uh, the three questions, the role of public universities. So this is very important to us in the University of California system. Uh, as you know, we are amazing and so how we're young and yet we have developed this amazing uh, higher ed uh, system. 
uh, and uh, at the same time within that system, the University of California, also there are differences across campuses and similarities, so that's also an interesting kind of challenge. Um, then the question of what is our ability to face the, the challenges that we have, that people have talked about, and to imagine the future. That's the most difficult thing you want unless you follow um, the advice that if you want to know what the future is like, you have to invent it, which is a famous line uh, by an inventor uh, in, the, in the Silicon Valley a long time ago. Um, and then the, f the, the question more general, again going back to us as public universities, is, uh, is also uh, to what extent do we are vulnerable? What's, what's the vulnerability and, and what we can do about it? So th those are, those are uh, excellent questions. And there's been a lot of literature. There's a huge literature. Um, first of all, there's old literature. I mean, even Immanuel Kant wrote about the faculties and the university. Lots of people in the past, famous philosophers and others. But there's a, more recently, I would say, in fact, over the last probably 10, 15 years, that there is really a flurry of these new uh, books that go from universities in the marketplace by the former uh, president of Harvard University Press. A book, there's another book I really very much uh, like and influenced me quite a lot. Uh, which is Louis Menon, uh, The Marketplace of Ideas, um, uh, came out a few years ago. And then there's other kinds of books about defending, uh, you know, making sure defending the, the liberal arts college education, the humanities in particular, uh, like Not for Profit uh, by Nils Baum. And, and then the most recent one, that there's, there's also uh, uh, books about the worry about the corporate turn, as somebody has talked about, uh, we're becoming too business like. And then one of the two most recent ones, uh, one is where you go is not who you'll be, uh, and the other one is uh, the end of college, which is also very interesting. Actually, it has a big part of end of college about the history of, of higher ed, which is actually very interesting. Now, th these are some of the issues that get talked about quite a lot. Uh, so the question, of course, you're familiar with. The rising cost of higher education, the students' debt, major national issue, uh, uh, and equal access to higher education and academic jobs, reduced support by state governments, um, value of the liberal arts education, and we have different opinions, you know, including the people in Silicon Valley, for example, and elsewhere who say that we don't need colleges at all. Um, sources of income, so higher ed as a business, um, and uh, the two cultures, let's talk, let's talk about academic, academic culture, corporate culture, um, and also the one thing that actually, as, as a dean, I do deal with quite a lot, and I'm going to say a few words about that later, which is the fact that there is an equal growth or actually decrease in different majors within the university. So this is, has to do with how popular different subject matters are, different disciplines and traditions, and whether in fact this is something that we're going to take into account. I mean, does it matter that you know, a particular discipline or a particular department you know, has 15 you know, majors as opposed to, you know, 2,800. Uh, and is that, is that even a comparison that should be made at all? So the, and, and so, and how do you judge? And, and, and then, you know, and how do you become accountable or should you be accountable or what are the criteria? So these are, these are all very important issues and, and, there's, and there's more. Uh, there is a question that I'm interested in particularly given my background, which is this distribution of knowledge. It's a tremendous distribution of variety of knowledge that people have in a, in a, in a university as an institution. Um, uh, the knowledge that a faculty member has from inside a department, for example, more than one department or program versus the knowledge that a chair would have by having to interact with other chairs and other people versus a dean versus other kinds of people working in the university and staff, the students' points of view. All of that contributes, like in any institution, to have all these different perspectives. Um, and, and sometimes I believe that uh, something happens, something that in my field, linguistic anthropology, uh, is called crosstalk. It's a term invented by John Gumpers, who was a linguist at UC Berkeley and a linguist and anthropologist. And that's to say that, that the differences in the background and the knowledge are so much that you know, you're talking across purposes sometimes. The, there's the issue of general education, which Menon has talked quite a lot. There's a question of autonomy of faculty, a faculty-run university, what does that mean, in which area. There's a question of reward system. We have, we have two main criteria that are quite diverse. We have meritocracy in the United States, and, and also we have market value in the United States, I mean, whereas it's not necessarily the case in other places. For example, I 
went to university. Uh, my first four years were at University of Rome in Italy. Uh, in Italy, whether you are, let's say, Umberto Eco, a very famous author, or you are somebody that nobody's ever heard of in the United States, at the same rank, you make the same amount of money. There's no difference whatsoever. We're in a different uh, world of, uh, of competition with respect to that. Um, and then there's new things that have to do with intellectual property, the roles that university have, and so forth. The question of the tension between teaching versus research, which does not have to be a tension, but it's been talked about as such, both, I would say, uh, uh, more of a, at a daily uh, level in the sense of feeling overburdened by too much teaching in some cases, uh, not having enough time to do research in some cases, but also the question of whether, in fact, this is something that at the end of college book I mentioned before, um, questions, in other words, that uh, we uh, have developed this hybrid, uh, which is that university that is concerned with both, is supposed to provide both teaching and research, and yet the value of those two are not the same. Uh, Oh, for that matter, we actually don't teach people to teach. I just would say very straightforward. Uh, typology of ideal students and ideal faculty, what that's about, adequacy and goals of undergraduate education, very, very important, of course, for what we do for our mission, and also graduate education. So these, these are some of the things that are going to be in the background. The question is, these are really, there's a lot of issues that are very interconnected and they're very challenging. So the question is, how, how do you go about trying to, I don't want to say solve them all because uh, nobody can do it on, uh, on their own and it needs a lot of collaboration, but uh, try to, to, to start do something about it if we are in a role of responsibility and responsibility changes, of course, uh, across uh, different uh, parts of the university, different people. So where do you get the knowledge to do this? Well, the thing that I need to say is that, um, as you know, uh, nobody's born a dean. And or a provost for that matter, uh, or even a chair. I mean, we would get hired for other reasons because we are hopefully good researchers and scholars and we, or we are seen as potentially becoming uh, really good scholars and researchers and hopefully also we are good teachers and, 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 and we have sometimes evidence, sometimes we don't. Now, uh, but then sometimes you also need something else and the question is, where do you get that knowledge? And also the question about how you go about doing, where you get inspired. So here's just, not because I want you to go out and buy all of them right away, but just to get you a sense that this is the kind of stuff I do, which is uh, Mario Biagioli alluded to. If you look at there, there's nothing there that would make you think at all. I think I can really even start doing this job that I've had over the last five and a half years. Uh, now, uh, Okay, well then, yes, as Mario was saying, I am an expert of communication. I am an expert of understanding differences also in communications and the moment by moment construction of a sentence, construction of an interaction or of an, of an identity of a relationship. Okay, that helps a lot when you're having, talking to people, have meetings, all of that. I study meetings in, in Samoa of the chiefs in the village. I paid attention to who was sitting where, things like this. Okay, that helps a little bit. You know, things like that, just trying to figure out who's the big, you know, bigger chief in the room. Yes, yeah, you know, who has status or not, who thinks who has status and so forth. But then also I have this other side, which is I did my research, among other things. I'm interested in improvisation, not only in what I'm doing right now, which is a form of improvisation, but also in music, for example, in performance. And I work with Kenny Burrell, UCLA, the, uh, the chair of the, uh, the, uh, the director of the jazz program for many years, teaching together and also recording. Uh, here's the two DVDs that I have produced with, with Kenny Burrell. Uh, so that is a side of this side of uh, performer audience uh, interaction, understanding how something, what a good performance is, understanding also uh, how you create something that has a basic structure but you do some variation and you create something new. So how do you create new uh, on the basic of something that's already there, that's already solid, like a tune, a standard, and then you start improvising on. This is another side, which is, goes back to when I actually was in my early 20s. This is a, a Spaghetti Western movie that I worked on. Uh, I was an assistant director on this movie uh, in the early 70s. I also worked as, as an editor on film and television. And um, that's important, working with people. I think that's something when we think about the organizational 
of the university, there are different uh, models, even within our own institution. So and there is, in the sciences, very typically, uh, we physical sciences, uh, you know, life sciences, there's the lab, uh, which is the basic idea is an idea of collaboration around a, a common goal, a project. Uh, and then we have uh, also, uh, you know, the more solitary scholar going to the archives, uh, going to spending hours and hours, you know, reading a text or, or watching a tape or listening to something uh, or reading through uh, all kinds of documents or, or even just looking at, uh, uh, at a lot of data and, and, and statistics and so forth. So this part of, of, the, of the spaghetti western I think is very important because uh, actually uh, allow me have experience about being in charge, part of a unit of people who are very, very different and uh, with, different, with different knowledge and, uh, and trying to make sense of this thing here. I mean, this is an amazing thing. I mean, th this are, these, are my, these are the chairs, these are my departments. There's 11 departments. And then there's all other kind of stuff there. There's centers. And, all kinds of things. There's, I have four associate deans, amazing people, all these people. I have staff, the people like that. See? And um, that's amazing. So <clears throat> all of that, in other words, the question is, try to be creative in the midst of that, in the sense that it's a big thing. It's, a, it's not that different from, a, from making a Western movie every day, me showing up on the set. It's a question of how do you introduce something uh, in such a complex you know, structure. By the way, that's, as you know, obviously only one division of four, right? So your provost has got a lot more stuff <laughs> under, right? I mean, connected to. So, and, 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 it's, and it's a lot of interaction with lots of people, lots of different ideas, um, and uh, very strong feelings about the way in which the university should be. And, 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 and so, and what is the relevant knowledge that, that for any for any, any one discussion. So this is some, just to give you a sense, these things that m matter or may not matter, depends how you look. This is from a statistic from uh, the UC. These are looking uh, undergraduate and graduate students in the social sciences, just to look at that, undergraduate and graduates go across time. And, and that gives you a sense that, for example, psychology obviously is very, very popular. And then economics, if you look at the undergraduates and then you have the other ones. Um, and then some that you might be familiar with might not even be in that graph. And then you go look at the graduate, there's a little slightly different uh, composition. Well, the interesting thing is that, uh, okay, that's something. These are the numbers I look at. So a, just if, I, if you just look at that, for instance, you learn, for example, that UCLA, anthropology, for example, now is just as popular as sociology. And then you learn, for example, uh, that economics has skyrocketed over time. We don't have a minor in, in, in business. So we're looking at numbers of this sort in terms of majors at UCLA. Economics, almost 3,000. Political science, is, we're keeping at that number, but we could go higher. And anthropology and sociology come together and, and so forth. So these are, these are big challenges because we don't really have actually enough you know, people in the team to deliver uh, sometimes uh, the kind of attention to teach, teaching and so forth that we would like to, especially when we go to upper division courses. So in all of this, that's just to say that there's a lot of information you've got to process and there's, and this thing is a train that is going at this amazing speed. It's just moving. We need to provide the services. We are in charge, I am in charge of making sure to provide the highest possible quality of both teaching to our students and a high quality of professional life for everybody around, that is our faculty and, and, and our staff. So that, the, the, that has to happen first as this train is moving and we have all these classes, all this stuff that you're very familiar with. Within that, can we change anything? That's a big challenge, right? So, Think about the future. Uh, a few years ago, I, I decided to experiment to think about this, and I decided instead of writing about the whole division, I wrote about uh, uh, my uh, discipline, anthropology, uh, just on this one I know uh, more about. Uh, but 
the idea was just to think about the challenge for, for, for everybody in the social science in particular. And, and these, are, these are the kind of challenges uh, in terms of fundraising, the job market, and, cor and the so-called cor corporate churn. And I, and I found the following things. First of all, that fundraising, it's not a new thing that we've got to go out there and raise money. It's not a new thing. Berkeley, Cal, when the Department of Anthropology was started, Mrs. Hurst provided the salary and the research funds for the first two positions for several years. So this is something that goes back a long time. Then, of course, if you look at somebody like Professor Biagioli's work and the Medici, this <laughs> Galileo, <laughs> it's really old. Um, so that's something interesting. It's something important to pay attention to how that was working at the time, how we have changed that over time. The other question is the question of this, this issue of you know, research. We are a big research university, very top in the world. Um, we're also t teaching, but are we something else? Do we, what does it mean to teach students? Um, in the olden days, there was no, no shame in talking about also being trade schools, so that there is a question of giving uh, students a profession, also go out there and get a job out there, and this was part of the preoccupation. And so this is also what, what not only students, but their parents were paying more and more over time, are concerned about that. Uh, so how do you prepare the students for the world out there after they've had this wonderful experience in our, one of our universities? Um, well, one way you can say is that if you get a BA, let's say, in sociology, is that you're going to be a little sociologist. Okay. That's, or that you're going to go to sociology uh, for graduate school. Okay. But only a small percentage of the whole, uh, of the whole goes actually to graduate school. And so what, is, what does everybody else do? And the same is true for any other uh, major for that matter. Um, and the other question is the question about, as you know, the word ent entrepreneurship is like on, you know, on a daily basis being mentioned all the time. Of course, Stanford has had a center for entrepreneurship for a long time, very successful. Um, and the question there is something that count, it seems counter to some more pure idea of research is something that we shouldn't be really corrupting ourselves and so forth. But the point, though, is that you all, as successful academics, actually turns out very good entre entrepreneurs. You have been very good entrepreneurs of yourself, your own research, your own program, whether it's because you apply for grants, you get money, or basically because the important publishers publish your books or, or journals publish your, your, your uh, article. Uh, and you can get the really good students and all of that. There is an entrepreneurial side of that uh, that in some ways I believe is a little bit uh, hidden. And the other thing is to talk about the fact that um, there is an important side of everything we do, whether or not we think of it that or not, that is to say the, the public out there uh, both is interested in the, you know, what it is actually that our research is, is for, where does it go, uh, and also that we, I think, have a responsibility to try to explain to the world out there what we do and why do we need to have a salary at the end of the month. So that's where we got, come to the, to the main idea. So the idea is, is, is to think about in terms of this thing I'm calling sideways disruption. Now, there's a famous, you know, Clayton Christensen, famous idea of disruptive in, innovation. As idea is, is, a, is, a, is a rupture in the market that comes up from the bottom of these uh, new companies that produce something cheaper and it's a much broader uh, mar market or markets that before were not actually uh, uh, even available or, or, or customers were not uh, able to afford to buy the product. So th there are ex these are famous examples about how the personal computer replaced eventually the mainframe uh, and then all kinds of cellular phones, you know, and in fact, the other yeah, phones and now are small computers, very powerful computers. Um, and the idea here uh, is that uh, you, start, you start out with something that uh, looks not competitive because you're going in a different direction, but at the end, this disruption actually is such that innovation is such that eventually takes over. And the Ford and the other big companies and so forth um, they, they can't keep up with it. So my idea is, is, a, is a little bit different, uh, and it goes more like this, that this idea that in this sideways disruption, the result is that the result of any initiative, a course of action, 
that shows alternative ways of being and doing with small rupture in overall organization in traditional practice. So these are small, small disruption. And this does, in a way, creates a parallel world, which is at the periphery, where the members of the community can safely experiment in practices. But these practices actually are violation. They violate mainstream assumptions, goals, and values. So an example of this is, I don't know, I don't know how, many, how many are familiar with David Kelly, this school at Stanford University. Um, uh, my associate dean, Jim Stigler, and I went to visit there a couple of years ago. And then David Kelly was very kind to take us around and explain the whole idea. And it's basically the idea that you take graduate students, actually, whatever field they're in, and you bring them into the school, which is within engineering, but has its own building. Uh, and uh, you use design techniques uh, to teach them and socialize them into this problem-oriented type of research that, at the end, has a product of some kind, whether it's a, you know, a new transportation system or designing a new piece of furniture, for example, including the furniture that you should use in a room like this or in a classroom. Um, this is very disruptive. Uh, it's disruptive because apparently David Kelly told us that the students that love it so much they don't want to go back to what they were doing before. So that's, that's pretty disruptive. I mean, uh, and, and the other interesting thing about this example is that um, he, he, he told us that at the beginning, um, nobody was really interested in this. The faculty were not really interested in, in, in doing anything of this sort. And what happened was that two things happened. Well, first of all, he, he found a lot of money that to, 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 to be able to build something with it, uh, with a large donation. But also, what he found was that the graduate students became interested. And the graduate students brought along with them a few faculty. I think he started with six. And with six faculty from different parts of campus and some students, they started this idea and now it's grown more and more and more. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm gonna tell you five stories. These are my st stories uh, of little disruption, uh, sideways disruption. Uh, or uh, one of them actually is an example of something that I didn't do. Uh, but I think in that, it's, it's a more classic, uh, successful example of a joint project, uh, the interdisciplinary project. I'm going to give it to you as an example. Or even within something that you can see, in a sense, quite traditional uh, from an academic point of view um, project, at the same time, you can have certain kind of disruption in interesting ways that show, sorry, show us what's possible, what's out there that we haven't even thought about. And by the way, any time, I think, we come up with an idea which is something new, it doesn't matter if it's a tiny little different thing that we do in the daily life or in the way we organize our office, for that matter, or a big idea like a new program, something that costs money. Um, there's always things that happen that you hadn't foreseen. There's a, these unintended consequences. And the, thing, and the important thing for me is to learn from both, from both what you were trying to achieve and whether you, you achieved that or also look at and also look at what you, you happened that you hadn't thought about. And some of the stuff that happens might not be good, but some of the stuff that happens might be very good and that's something that we can learn. So here are, the, here are the stories. The first story is the story of this project uh, that I was not part of but I know a lot about it because it was in my department and I know the director very, very well. And it was uh, sponsored by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation that gave uh, over $11 million, uh, basically over a period of nine years, uh, for a multidisciplinary project on middle class er, fa families. And this was part of six centers in the United States, and they had, each of them uh, had different methodologies, different types of uh, scientists or social scientists involved. Uh, this one particular was on everyday life. This is, it went inside people's home. It was doing a video recording of, of the, uh, a day in the life of, doing several days of the, of, of the week, uh, and seeing when the, the day starts in the morning, parents have to wake up their kids. They, get, they have to get them out of bed. They have to get them to the breakfast, get dressed, breakfast has to be served, they have to be ready to go, brush their teeth and do all these other things, make sure they remember their homework, all of that stuff, go out in the world. And they go in the SUV or whatever other cars they have, and they take them to school, and then they go to work, and then they go 
and one of them pick them up, usually the mother, uh, and then come home, and then they, the whole thing starts again in different ways. Actually, it starts before because sometimes they start doing their homework while they're inside the car, uh, and then the dinner has to be prepared, and all kinds of things that have to happen. So that turns out uh, to be something that in order to document that, not only you need to have people who allow you to go into their homes and have 32 families and be comfortable with you around, and after a while people get comfortable because they have too much to do. Life goes on. You don't have time to be worried about what the, the person with the video camera is doing. And, um, and, and, and then, you know, there, is, uh, there was all these people doing different things. For example, this, how was this innovation? Well, for one thing, we had anthropologists, like medical anthropologists looking at health. Uh, that we had archaeology that counted every single object that was in the house, thousands and thousands of objects. In fact, one of the major findings of this is clutter. <laughs> that middle class is absolutely overwhelmed by all these objects they buy, many of which they do not need, and most of which they can't get rid of, and therefore you need a garage to have another fridge there and to put all the stuff they can't, doesn't fit in the house anymore, and therefore I believe only a couple of families actually use the garage for the cars because there's not enough space to put all the stuff they accumulated over time. So all of this was documented not only with the video, it was also documented with photos, about 28,000 photos uh, of these homes. Um, the the, the uh, clinical psychologists also in the project uh, uh, had the family, each member of the family take cortisol um, uh, values, th you know, three times a day uh, uh, and uh, then was measured and they found all these interesting things, including the fact that mothers actually stress level, cortisol level stays exactly the same when they go home. And in fact, and the father's levels goes down. Fathers come, the ghosts try to greet the kids. Usually they don't pay attention to them. They go into another room, they sit, relax, watch TV, sports, something else, and things happen. There's a lot of information this has happened, and it's a fantastic project. It's a project where the, the team, about 60 people with undergraduate, graduate students, uh, eight, eight faculty, and, and, and postdocs changing over time, except for the faculty stay the same, over nine years, met every single week for two hours, and uh, they all knew all the data, had access to all the data, they shared the same, and they call families by saying, oh yeah, number, family number two does that all the time. Oh yeah, no, but what about family 13? I remember another thing. And they had this incredible shared knowledge uh, from these families across the United States. And there's something I just wanna, uh, I mean, this, this is a project can, that can be talked about for hours and hours, but I only wanna focus on one thing. Two books came out. One book was a book basically uh, done with photographs. Well, out of those 28,000 photographs, um, we hired, I say we because I was involved uh, in, 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 the, in the transaction, we hired uh, a, an Italian photographer, a really f amazing, f very accomplished Italian photographer, um, uh, to look at 28,000 photos and pick what the ones he thought were the best and then uh, play with them through Photoshop and reprint them and so forth. We, they also hire a, a graphic designer and so forth. And they had the archaeologists write the main part of this book with lots of statistics and stuff, but lots of images. A lot of it was about, about clutter and all these other objects and toys and all kinds of things. Um, and the second book came out the year later. It's a book, uh, this was published by the University of California Press. It's a book of essays about specific topics that had to do with health, uh, they have to, we have to do with the family relations and all kinds of things. Um, well, interesting, here's the part of the story I'm interested in. Nobody wanted to publish the first book. The academic presses were scared to publish this book. Uh, it's like they saw it as a coffee table book. They thought it was going to cost a fortune with all the color photos. They were not ever going to be able to get the money back. They were wondering about, in fact, if it was even an academic book or not, despite the status and the you know, of, of the authors involved in the project and so forth, all top researchers. And so the, 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 the team uh, went around from one published to the next, and then, and then they couldn't get, it was very, very difficult. Finally, uh, UCLA, there's a very good press for archaeology, the, uh, the Coastal Institute of Archaeology, 
we have, and they have their own press, and usually they publish books that sell about between 300 and 500 copies. Uh, beautifully produced, and they had the review, and they published it. Okay, here's what happened. Life at Home in the 21st Century, the photo book sold over 5,000 copies. It was a big success right away. There were articles all over the place, all over the, all over the, uh, the media, the press. The other one is doing okay, just academic books the way they do. Hopefully we'll pick up with time. But this just came out, as a, it's a, just a one page of an article in Time Magazine, from I think it was from last week or two weeks ago. Basically, this, this article not only quotes the, the research project, UCLA project all over the place, but basically is redoing the project and redoing the photos as imitations of the UCLA photos, but have their own photos. So that's just a sign, I think, of success. But the important thing is that this is something that any time you talk about to people, uh, any time we talk about it, any, and, and, and you know, some of the research have been on television and so forth, is of incredible appeal to the world out there for people to understand themselves to see themselves and to have a documentation of what's going on and what is that they're dealing. They recognize themselves, they see the problems and try to figure out how to address them. Uh, and by the way, the group has also, has also put out um, some recommendations for, for, uh, uh, for families uh, where both, both parents work and so forth. Okay, story number two. This is my own project, first project, social science in practice, I convinced uh, my provost, when I, I was appointed, that I wanted to do something new. I want to had this idea of engaged social sciences, doing something, promoting work that show the relevance of social science out there in the world. And um, I used some of these funds that I had to, ha in collaboration with an, uh, another office for diversity at UCLA, to hire six new PhDs. It was a two-year program, and I met with them every week. They, each each uh, postdoc also taught two classes in the department. The department was involved also in screening and, and selecting the people. They, they, they were quite diverse as a group, um, and um, we had a wonderful time together. Uh, I had people come and you know, talk to them from different parts of the university, invited speakers and so forth. And one of the things that came out of all this was that uh, these were all researchers. Uh, interesting enough, they're all women. Um, and who did work from different areas, from uh, uh, economics, uh, political science, uh, geography, sociology, anthropology, in this case of medical anthropology, history who are interested in the implications of their work for things that could be changed out there in society, okay? And um, it was, they became very close to each other. We created a cohort out of this. It was a lot of fun to be with them, learn from them. I also advised them. And however, they did not become integrated in our system. They did not have a, any kind of effect that I could see within each department. That, did not work as an experiment. And from that point of view, you know, there were five of them, you know, got jobs uh, and so forth. And the first thing I remember that happened was I brought in uh, some faculty from a center where actually they are engaged, uh, uh, senior faculty was engaged with the community for a long time uh, and bringing also high school students into UCLA and so forth. And uh, the first thing that the, the faculty told this, this postdoc was, look, if you want to get a job, don't, don't, don't worry about being engaged too much out there because you need to concentrate on publications. So I was going against something that's very, very basic, very, very important. I didn't have enough there somehow of an idea that somehow I could carry through. This is another project. A project is called Partnership with UCLA. And what this is is that we took an, a pro, something that was going on in economics, a, a program called uh, Sharp Fellows. And this project um, that is, is a way in which, ha what happens is that uh, business people, typically uh, UCLA alumni, but also other people, come into the university, and they interview a selected group of undergraduates, and in the process, uh, they also socialize them and give feedback about how do one does an interview for a job. And then the best of them are selected to have an internship in the, in the summer in a company and get a fellowship, okay? So um, from that idea, we decided uh, to expand this 
And actually, we should say, well, it shouldn't just be for people who are interested in business. And so we're doing this thing called Partnership UCLA, which is that for started with my division and having, therefore, bringing back alumni and other people interested in the university, and people are very interested in the university. People love to come and listen to what is that their students are doing. And so have students perform, present the research they're doing in a particular class or some project they're doing and have that kind of involvement because then the alumni and other people from the community can come in and become mentors. Now this is obvious in the business world, less obvious for example if you move to other fields like sociology for example, but in fact turns out to be very productive and this is also a way of uh, connecting, reconnecting to our base and our alumni and this is something by the way that my uh, development team absolutely loves. So what we learn, we learn a lot. Uh, we learn that actually when you look at, when you talk to, to business people, entrepreneurs, what they're really looking for, no, it's not necessarily somebody who has, has to have uh, an economics BA necessarily degree or business degree, but it has to have some very basic features, I mean abilities. So strong written and oral communication, being able to problem solve, think critically, outside the box as they say, have analytical skills, for example, make sense of trends, of common issues, and to have teamwork and collaboration. Now, the interesting thing, why is that interesting? To me, it's interesting because that can be done anywhere. It can be done anywhere. It can be done in the humanities, it can be done in social sciences, it can be done in life sciences and physical science. And in fact, in some of these, some of these fields, it happens more than, in, more than in other people. So, so those are important in terms of also where is that we want to put uh, our energy and, and, and how can we think ahead of time in terms of preparing a student. For example, one of the things that uh, the people participating in this program say, uh, the, the, the mentors say, is that the, the, when they interview somebody who has a BA, and they say, well, so what is your BA? You know, they look at the CV and say, maybe you have a BA in anthropology. And they ask the question, says, well, what did you learn? And the student says, well, I, I learned about anthropology. Well, that doesn't do it. The point is that you have to be able to do that permutation of understanding what is that all this knowledge that you had accumulated uh, that you got from these really great researchers, what in the moment of having a different kinds of a job than an academic job uh, or talking over dinner table conversation, what is that exactly that you, you, you learn uh, about all kinds of skills that in fact are important in the, in the, in the workplace. Uh, then one, uh, partly going up to Stanford, but also we know how, how su successful Stanford and other universities have been about a startup business. And so one idea my associate dean, Jim Stigler, uh, who is very entrepreneurial, uh, came to me one day several years ago and said, you know what, uh, so I heard somebody came, came, one of our alumni, uh, in communication study, I was talking to uh, the chair of communication, Tim Growling, and she said it's really too bad that UCLA gives a great education, but there's no startup of any kind. So he said, I need some money to start, and I said, okay, sure, let's go. And we started this thing. And the interesting thing about that was that we opened it up to everybody. It wasn't just, it wasn't just in the social sciences immediately. And the first meeting was uh, students came, about 70 students showed up, it was, it was one uh, young entrepreneur, and she gave us stories of success and failures. Uh, and f 70 students came from 40 departments on campus. It was, it was an immediate success. It was very popular. We had a series of events. Um, and then after that, uh, where people mingle and they started to network with one another, and some of this resulted in companies that the students uh, created and ran. And then from that came the idea of the accelerator. We did a UCLA accelerator in the summer program. We actually gave, we uh, did not set it up so that we would make money on their invention, but uh, we actually gave a uh, fellowship. We raised money for that. Uh, we went out and raised money for it. And the people loved this idea. We even went up to Silicon Valley to some of our, uh, of our alumni. Um, and this was a program in the summer for 10 weeks where 10 companies were selected. The first time 40 companies uh, applied. And we had all kinds of people came. We created a real program uh, teaching them business and all kinds of things. And people like this Mike Jones, former CEO of MySpace, who's now at Science Inc., uh, came to speak to, to the students and so forth. Uh, and and, and these, uh, they learned these very practical skills, but also they learned some of these things that I'm going to go back here for a second. Teamwork. 
tremendous amount of teamwork. Uh, and, and thinking outside the box, yes. Having analytical skills, yes. Problem solving, yes. And then they had to figure out the oral communication was very, very important. And part of the writing, of course, so what goes in the presentation. So but now here's what happens. Then there were these, there was a demo day at the end of the summer, the beginning of S September. And I went to, there were two. There was a VIP one, it was very crowded, lots of people from the LA community, uh, Silicon Beach uh, in, in Venice. And, uh, and they did each company presented for five minutes, they gave their pitch, and they presented their product. And I was sitting there, and I watched all of them. And then the second night, when it was open to a larger public, about 300 people showed up, and I went again. And I sat through that. I was really impressed. I thought, this is amazing. Um, what happened? Well, the first thing that happened was that after a little while we were doing this, Blackstone, uh, decided to sponsor uh, entrepreneurship in Southern California, gave money to UCLA, UC Irvine, and USC. And so what happened at the same time, that part of that was because they, say, they saw what we did with, with Startup UCLA. So at that point, what I did was I gave Startup UCLA to the Dean of Undergraduate Education because at that point I realized that it has to be something for the whole university and should have that kind of sponsorship and organization. And so we had a launching of that. Uh, we had people come and, 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 and talk about what they've been doing, and then they have our, this is our chancellor, Jim Block, and then the dean of uh, undergraduate education, Pat Turner. Very good, very good. So um, from that came this other idea, uh, dissertation launchpad. And the idea came here. So I'm actually sitting there somewhere, right there. And I was, I was at this meeting, and, uh, and as I said, I was very impressed. And I, and I, and I told uh, my colleague, Jim Stig, I said, this is, it was so good. The students were so good. And he said, well, you know, we hired this coach, Barbara Seymour Giordano, who teaches people to give uh, uh, TED Talks. And she trained them. She trained the students to do this presentation. And that's when I thought, wait a second. But the content of this presentation doesn't really matter. The, you can put anything inside. It's, it's a format. It's a way of presenting. It's a way of being out there in front of a public and pitching an idea. You can put very traditional, straight, interesting, innovative research. We can move it up to the graduate students. So I created this thing called Dissertation Launchpad. I actually raised money for this. Uh, and uh, we tried it out. Uh, we put out a call. And uh, we had applications. Not too many, by the way, but enough to have a group of 10. It usually was, initially it was 11. There were 10 women and one man. The men dropped out after the first week. <laughs> and, um, and we did this. We met every week. And we talked about, they were all from different departments, like political science, or sociology, history, anthropology. And we talked about, what's your idea? What's your dissertation about? And these were people at different stages. Uh, psychology, by the way. We all said psychology. Um, and, uh, and everybody was struggling, actually. And these were very, very smart people. They know a lot. But they were really struggling, trying to figure out what exactly is my dissertation about. Yeah, let's say, tell us, what is it about? Well, you know, it's about, I know, I've study. Well, I don't know. No, you've got to tell us what it's about. What is in, what's interesting and so forth. What is it? What do you think is interesting? Why do you think it's important? And we went through that for nine weeks. And at some point, Barbara Giordano came in and had one-on-one -on -one sessions. First, actually, she gave a whole talk about giving talks. She told them how to do PowerPoints, that she shouldn't put too much information and all kinds of things. And she told them that they had to write a script of 1,100 words and then work with them. And then she said, you've got to memorize. You can't read anything when you get in front of an audience. And you have to do it for eight minutes. It was a lot of fun. The best part for me was at the very end, the last time, the ninth week, when we redid all the titles. They had all their titles. And then we sat together and we try, started to come up with some crazy ideas about titles. And at the end, we redid all the titles. And that, by that point, there was a tremendous kind of bonding and we participated in that. And this was the announcement. Uh, we invited everybody, including my colleagues, the other deans, uh, the, our provost. Uh, and, and people came. 
and, uh, and, and, and our, our biggest donor came. Uh, and um, he loved it, uh, Mario Luskin. And, um, and people were crazy about it. And uh, the only thing is that before they started, they said, well, how come there are only women? And, and I didn't have an answer for that question, as a matter of fact. And then the second version, actually, we, we improved. Uh, I think this re is related uh, to some, there's some hypothesis you can make, and maybe some of you will have them, but it's, 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 an, interesting, it's an interesting question to, to ask. Um, but there were, there were people who were ready to risk something to a little bit different because, of course, when you're, when you're doing your dissertation, you're very involved, um, and you, you have a lot of pressure, and so this is an extra thing that people have to do. And one of the things I did, I decided, we decided the first time when we did it to do a competition. So everybody came and uh, had, had a list of everybody, had to vote the best three. And then I gave, I, I gave $5,000 to each of the top three. And it was very interesting to see. First of all, because it was counted by the dean of the graduate division, not by us, uh, the votes. And what came out was that, first of all, there wasn't a huge difference between the people on the very top and the people at the bottom. It showed their appreciation. Um, but also, it was very interesting to see who won, and, 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 and there's also ways to think about that. In other words, what are the kind of research, perhaps, that is, what you could say, more photogenic in some ways, that immediately has an immediate appeal or not? What does that tell you about presenting, presenting uh, your work out there? Uh, this is um, one, of, one of the, uh, uh, the presentations uh, in psychology. Uh, and uh, this uh, was so good that the dean, of, the dean of life science actually asked her to go with her to, to raise money. I mean, she has such a good show that from that point on, then she became a celebrity. Uh, always paid by the social sciences, of course. Now, the last part is that, like all uh, stories, there, there's, there's all kinds of ways to make sense of these and have uh, moral and practical lessons. And here are, here are the th lessons. And before we go into the discussion, I'd be happy to uh, answer questions. So one is that to use existing examples of success and failure uh, as a way of finding alternative ways of doing research, teaching, and connecting to the non-academic world out there. Um, to find, also, you need to find original individuals with different points of view and experience who can be your allies and playmates. For me, this is very, very important to develop a plan for a new practice that would be too risky on a large scale, but manageable on a small scale. Uh, so for example, take a dissertation launch pad. How do you go from 10 to 80, 100, or more, 200, 300, 500? That's a very interesting challenge. Um, um, Alan Alda, the actor, has a program that based on different principles. We've talked to him. He knows about our program. His principle is based on improvisation and getting the, the researcher to be able to talk to people in a way that not to lose your audience, which apparently he says we do a lot, um, losing the audience. And so the question is, is, is how do you do that? Um, also, it's very important, I think, to pitch your idea to people outside of academia. And that was the idea of our, for innovation. Uh, because they, are, they have been people, these are people, especially when they've been successful doing what they're doing. They very often have been doing things that are new. And, and they can give you a sense of reality of something that, in, that which there is appreciation for what we do and yet has this connection to the outside. The other thing is important, I think, is, is the question of financial support. And I think these are ideas where I found that donors or potential donors are very interested in. They love this idea. And by the way, the people love to come to these things because it's like going back to school, but only for one night and you get to learn all these things. And, and they're all one more interesting than the next. And there is a real thirst out there, hunger, for really getting into what it is that we do, what we're good at, what is that our students are really doing, and, and this wonderful research uh, that they're doing. And, and from that, all kinds of connections uh, can happen. And finally, for me, is that to make sure that in the team that you work with, in these new ideas, in this new enterprise, um, you work closely with them. So you don't just have an idea and then drop it, but in fact, I've been very, very close. I've, some of them I've done myself, participate. Very important to listen, constantly listen to what is that, the feedback about how things are going and so, and so forth. Be ready to, to, to revise and think about it. The second time we did the dissertation launch pad, we did it a slightly different way. 
uh, and, and there's a tremendous amount of learning. And each of these things in themselves, they're little steps, little things, sideways kind of disruption. But if you think about it, actually each of them are quite different from the way in which we normally think about academia. That's it. Gentle kind of disruption at the edge. Uh, Sandra, do you want to? Sure, I, I can. Just speak to sure. I was really fascinated by the dissertation uh, launch pad. You know, scientists or for that matter, any scholars talking to the public about what they're doing or to others not in their specialties. Right. It's a huge skill. Yes. So any thoughts about how you make that, you brought in a you know, national leader uh, to coach these students in your right. first run through. Any thoughts about scaling it up? How much do you need to scale it up to really be transformative? Uh, right. and any thoughts about doing this in a more distributed fashion? Thank you. So the question is uh, the scaling up. First, I, let me go to the, you, you mentioned the coach who is really, yes, uh, quite, known and very, very skilled. Um, so let me bring up something I, I didn't bring up, which is that there was also a clash. Uh, there was a clash between her idea of uh, what those eight minutes should be like, the students' ideas when they first walked in, and some of the people in the audience, particularly some of my colleagues, and others. So. Even though I would say that there was really overall, I would say almost 90% of the audience really loved it, um, including the students. Uh, but there was also an issue about how we represent ourselves. So when we talk about the challenge, there's, there's multiple challenges. For example, uh, the, first, the first year, um, Barbara Giordano was worried about the fact that there was such a short time to work with the students that the best way to get them to tell a story, and by the way, that's a crucial point about telling a story, uh, was to make it personal. So all the research became, started out with a personal story that you know, they would go into the, the project. That worked out very well for some of the students, but for some it was a little too personal. So there, 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 was, there was this tension there. So one of the things that we did in the second version is that we went more to less personal and more towards uh, something that was also very important to us, which obviously, which was the value of the research and the value of what is that a particular tradition or discipline brings to that. Now, scaling. Scaling um, does have a problem. The first one is this is actually expensive. It's a little expensive. Uh, you know, because the way we're doing it now, we have two faculty actually there, and we have a coach. Uh, and then actually, I believe that if you want the students to do something like this, which is really outside of what they're doing in a moment of pressure, you probably, we took away the price, by the way, because the first generation said at the end, oh, we don't want to have the price because we don't want to compete with one another. We all like each other, and blah, 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 blah. It's all American dream. Everybody's the same. So, okay, so we took it out, but that created other kinds of, kind of problems. For example, we couldn't get people in to apply. The first thing is, well, you get $5,000 first time, and now you're not gonna give anybody. So there are these very, very interesting issues about what this is thing is about. Um, I would say that two things. One is, I think that to scale it up, we would have to figure out a way to get more people to buy into the idea that this is a good thing. So to get more f faculty participation and more outside participation. Uh, and so we need to do something about uh, both the, the, the organization, what, you know, the way this is done, uh, and at the same time to make it more of a routine kind of thing. In other words, for me, the disruptive part to be very straightforward is that if I can, through these things, show people that there is a value in doing this kind of enterprise. In other words, in doing, speaking in a slightly different way, but in an interesting way to a different audience, and that you should be spending time doing that. That, to me, is an important disruption. In other words, even if we don't do it for everybody, 
uh, I think that in itself is a value that can, can transfer to other areas, I would say. Um, some very interesting examples of, of, as you say, a general kind of disruption at the edges. But if you look at the list of disruptors and disruptees that you had, in all those cases, I mean, this is what Christensen talks about, uh, it begins with a gentle kind of disruption at the edges, and then somebody figures out how to blow it up completely and do it differently. So one way to view all of this is what you've presented is to say this demonstrates that the present structure of the university is sort of right ripe, excuse me, for large-scale disruption. And I don't know where that's going to come from, but somebody's going to figure it out. I don't think anybody's really gotten close to it yet. Right. But it's out there. It's out there just right. waiting to be disrupted. Right. So uh, I think that I agree with you. I, I think that my idea is that you need to bring people along. Just You just go ahead a little bit. Uh, you're just a little bit ahead, but just try to bring people along. So I, I, I have great confidence in the students. Uh, that's why Startup UCLA but is so important. Uh, then I have great confidence, uh, and then comes next, come the graduate students who usually, you know, feel bad if they think they're not going to get, especially in the human and social sciences because uh, that's a particular, particular to them, that if they don't get an academic job, um, and uh, I, I think that the, more, the new faculty bring in, the, the more junior faculty coming in as a new generation who have grown up in a different world, who are thinking more about these issues, probably they were thinking already about it when they were undergrads or even before they're in high school. I think all of that can provide then a new context in which these examples can then be uh, transferred you know, in, in a different way. But the problem is that the way we are organized now within, in a university, I, am, I haven't seen a possibility of doing sort of top down. So the, the, problem, the question is that the challenge, I think, for us is to show good examples that bring, to bring pe people along. And I find that there's a lot of enthusiasm. Now, even I would say more senior faculty who were very skeptical about this and they thought we're just being, just selling out. Uh, they came and they saw what their students were doing. And I, I had somebody who said, Last time we just did uh, the, the um, dissertation launch pad event a few weeks ago, I had one of my, my colleagues came to me she, and she said, you know, that student, that, she's one of my students, she did a presentation last year, it was really terrible. And she did such a fantastic job, and she, she had done a fantastic job. So seeing that brings in, a, you know, a different way of, of, for the faculty themselves to accept that as an idea, and that's why I'm Oh, sure. So maybe um, I missed it from uh, the uh, presentation that you did of the dissertation lounge, but I was wondering if you could tell us wh what was the ratio? Did they find jobs? How, how Which one? The dissertation lounge, the, the f 10 people who participated in the uh, and worked with the co coach. Uh, I, actually, the first the first generation was I don't have the latest uh, on that except from uh, uh, now it's uh, two things I have for that we did a we did a questionnaire because the donor wanted to see actually how they they felt about it afterwards um, and it was very extremely positive I mean people felt very good about it, even though during the exercise I mean the, during the ten weeks especially the the, the last week and there was a lot of pressure. Uh, and they felt very good about the experience, so we know that. We, I have some couple of cases uh, that I know closely, uh, and one is somebody who had gone up to Stanford for a postdoc, a really very excellent, prestigious three-year postdoc. She had gone for the first interview, and then she went back after she had done a decision on which right, and she got it, and I think, I mean, it, of course, cause effect to your scientists, you know, it's not easy to do. But there's, some, there's something there about, I've seen her presentation, and the same was true for somebody else who told me things like, and this has happened, actually, several narratives of this kind, of being in a place and being asked what you do and so forth, and having a way of presenting yourself, you know, that sort of was, you know, they heard themselves in a different way. 
I think that's also very important in terms of how you see yourself and an ability to present, present something, you know. And then, of course, everybody's going to do it in a different way in this. But I, th I think there's an, eff there's, a, there's an effect there. It's just a scary thing for most people, as you know very well. I mean, to just show up like that, eight hey, minutes, boom, here's what it's about. I can't read anything. And if you, lo if you saw, I mean, look, I'm very interested in performance. So that's why I, t I take time going into this. But I saw them the night before in the rehearsal. I, I was terrified. I mean, like the last time there was, there was, there was one person, he, he just kept reading every two words. He couldn't remember anything. Now that, is, to me, there's something about that that is transformative. In other words, to, to realize that you know, there's more to ac academia than just to give an example. This thing of going like this for 30, 40, 45, 50 minutes. <laughs> You know, and by the way, that thing can be a beautiful text. That's not the, that's not the issue. But I think there's something, uh, there's, so, there's something there ultimately uh, is, is very precious in some, in some ways. Exactly how it's going to be precious, I can't tell, actually. Yeah. Which is persistence. Sure. These are great examples of innovative disruptions. And in my experience, um, you can come up with these ideas and get them to succeed. But the academy has a great way of kind of healing over yeah. any sort of wounds. So um, <laughs> it takes a lot of personal persistence to get them to succeed. And then the minute that persistence disappears, they just you know go away. So have you learned anything about how we can get these innovations to stick? and spread instead of just staying in these little niches where they do great work and then die. Yes, that is in fact um, our challenge. I, I think that um, we need to uh, have people, to involve people in running things uh, who are open to trying new things, uh, who uh, have ideas, but can work in teams and can listen. That's what I was saying. So in a sense, that to me is the thing that over time can transform. And one of the reasons why I think there is a chance is that there's a lot of pressure for this thing that we love so much to be undone. So the world is not really there waiting to see what we're going to do. So. I think, you know, and my, what, I, what I find encouraging to me is that uh, there is strong interest in, as I said, in faculty colleagues, colleagues who did not think at the beginning it was a good idea. Uh, and I think there is a strong interest uh, in my experience with alumni uh, and donors. And I, and I also think that these are things that um, they're not too complicated. They're not too complicated. Uh, and it could be that, you know, that by the time you get to do it the third or four times, then you decide that you're going to do something related but different. But, but the, the question here is, is to, to be able to create a context of flexibility, you know. In other words, as we know, everybody's writing the same thing. The classroom thing, we've been doing it for, you know, well, I guess over 100 years. There was more apprenticeship in the olden days. but um, but. We've been done that. We have blown it to you know the maximum, depending how big the rooms can be. Uh, and that I think I think that that everybody's saying that can now go on, go, you know, all the time. So there's so many things going on like that in terms of, uh, of pressure, that, you know, on, on the university. And and I think that there, we need something, some stories that are good stories, that are success stories, uh, where people can then see something positive, as opposed to feeling like you know things is going to go after them and they will never and not be worried about rep be reproducing themselves. I mean we're very worried about not reproducing ourselves. The good thing about becoming a dean is that you start taking perspective of other departments, other things. And yeah, your department special, you love them, but there's more people out there in the world. So we can uh, keep uh, uh, chatting past the uh, uh, fourth minute. Uh, so the question, you know, I want to go back to. We got two questions about the 
you know, how you can trace this uh, kind of coaching training you know, uh, to your potential <coughs> professional success. Yeah. So my, my uh, you know, I've seen, like for instance, in, in, uh, in STS, because people often have different backgrounds. So they, you know, if you give them a chance to talk at a job interview or whatever, they stand out because they can bring in all sorts of things and, you know, but they need to have the chance, right? And instead, typically they get the chance through by, by people who have looked at their CV first, right? right. So, so the question is, you know, and, and this goes back to the, one of the first, uh, ex, you know, experiments you did with the five students, the people were telling them, no, 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 no don't play, you know, right. stick to their field. Uh, they didn't, and still they got you know uh, jobs quickly. Right? So the question is, I don't think that there is a doubt that if these people are given a chance, then they right. just uh, get the job. But how is there a way to manage the transition from CV to job interview or CV to classroom? So from text to performance, right. how can the CV? Is there, is there a way to do that? That's a very good question. I, I was, uh, before I was thinking about Alan Kay, uh, who was a Xerox Park a long time ago. Um, he's the one, I think, is, who said the thing, if you want to predict the future, you're going to invent it. Um, and one of the things he told me was um, that, that uh, uh, Xerox Park at the beginning, um, people didn't, the, the person who was hiring didn't look at CVs. They just talked to people. There was no CV. Um, so, can we do that? That's an interesting, I mean, that's an interesting challenge. And what would that be? I mean, you know, people, as you know, it, metaphors are interesting. So, people, when people, when you hire somebody and they get tenure, you think people say, like, it's like a marriage, you know, stuff like that. I mean, so we have, we have these ideas of these things that, you know, we make a decision, it's got these consequences forever and ever and ever. It's very, very, very long term, right? And the same is for when we create, you know, a center or an institute or something. It's going to be there forever. If you don't do it, if you take away the funding, people think, you're, you know, you're terrible or whatever, you're cheap or something. Um, so the question is, I think that's an interesting transformation. Uh, it could happen because, you know, just boom, the, the governor takes out the carpet from under our feet, and so suddenly we've got this little problem. Uh, but, but this shouldn't happen that way. In other words, um, it should happen in a way that we have a space, you know, a safe space, if you want, to, to, to experiment. And, and I think that that's, a, that's a great experiment. In other words, that, I mean, it's the same about, you know, the GREs and SATs. You know, how do, how do we end up with this, you know, the students that we end up with? Can we have a place to experiment? Can we have somebody, you know, as some people are talking about, like some taking students are very good at one thing, not that they have to know everything. Like in Europe and even in Canada, I believe you, you can go to university in one thing. You know, you pick your major before you start, right? So all of these things uh, are connected, and I think the thing that we can try to do uh, is precisely to, to create opportunities to try something different uh, and then show that that works, so, or how it works. So, and then, of course, there's going to be other challenges. However, for example, I, 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 you know, working on a new program, and see if you do a new program, different kinds of things. Can you create a program that doesn't go through the usual channels? Because can we do a program, can we do things that do not select precisely, you know, in the same way? The flip side of that is that, uh, go back to the dissertation launchpad, for example, is that when you get something down to eight minutes, well, you also, in a way, you've got to simplify. And so simplification sometimes can be a problem because something that you think of as very complex, it can sound being trivial. Are you, are you ready to give up this or not? And what are the implications of all of that? So, so the, the, there is a lot that in, in, in that sense, but I think in each case, uh, in each case, I think in, we should know what our neighbors are doing and steal the good ideas, um, just like Galileo. It at this time. It's still a lot. So. Oh, sorry. Yes. I was I was struck in story number three. Uh, you had a list of I think it was five attributes that employers were looking for right. uh, for undergraduates, and none of those included 
disciplinary expertise or subject knowledge. Right. And so to be more disruptive, I suppose, does it, does that, can that lead us to the conclusion that the discipline doesn't really matter at the undergraduate level? Um, that uh, whether you're a sociologist, an anthropologist, a psychologist, and a uh, historian, uh, economist, whatever, is, is pretty much irrelevant, and that if we uh, prepared undergraduates uh, without reference to a discipline so that they could no longer say, well, I'm a sociologist, but rather w we would leave them with the s skills and abilities to describe what they know and can do, um, that they might be better off. You said it. Okay. <laughs> it's a good theory. I mean, uh, I, I don't have much to add to that. I mean, really, it's, it's, it's a different enterprise. Uh, I need, that's also, it's also, what you left out, it's also what's graduate, graduate school about. That's the other, the other side. So I always think that, this also relates to what Mario was saying. So I always think that um, we, are, we have the best university system in the world, as we've been told. I mean, Germany used to before World War II, then they, they destroyed it. It was destroyed. Um, and I always say that about American universities, the same thing that my son says about Italian food. The average is very high. <laughs> so our PhD, the average is very high. It's amazing how high it is when you go around the world. The, the, the question is, you know, what does that mean? So I think it, it means two things. It means that very often in some fields, not all of them, I admit, but in some fields we start over. This goes to your point about training, the training in graduate school. And the other thing is that when somebody comes in with a really idea that doesn't seem to fit into anything that I've ever done before, I say, this is not a good idea. You shouldn't do it. You're not allowed to do it. I wouldn't do it. No, you can't. No, it's a terrible idea. It's never been done, and I don't think it's a good at all. You're never going to get a job. So again, it has to do with this idea of leaving. Do we have a way to allow for some of those things to happen, to, 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 to let the students you know, try some of that? And I think in systems where there's much less monitoring, the average is not as high, but once in a while you can get some, some amazing ideas coming, coming through for people experimenting with that. Yes? So you talked about little sociologists, or little psychologists, and, and that, that's a really interesting, uh, this is not on, is that it? Oh, that's a really interesting question, but these departments are doing relatively well. Absolutely. Generating uh, student hours, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no real pressure for change, is there? OK. So <clears throat> UCLA had 110,000 applications, I think, this year. Um, and uh, we moved, we're doing well from that point of view. Um, I don't know your numbers, but I believe you've done fine. Uh, um, why do we need to worry? It's a good question. Why do we need to change anything? I believe that um, we're not doing so well, as a matter of fact, because for one thing, our cost is insane. I mean, the cost of education is, is amazing. I mean, we, we provided, in, in some respect, a really you know, good product and to some, to some extent. We do produce, I mean, our university definitely uh, tremendous research. Uh, but I think that, I don't think that actually this is sustainable, uh, the way we're going. Uh, and it, I mean, we happen to have a former governor who is our, who is our president, uh, who I think is the best person we could ever have to talk to another governor. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a constant. It's going to be a constant struggle. So the, the 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 question is, can we imagine? Can we reimagine some of the of the things that we're doing in a way that actually has a more matches some parts of the world out there, and not to have the separation that even we have these beautiful campuses and there's no gates and everything, but in fact there is a gate. And so can we open it up? And people coming in, and can we learn from people coming from outside and coming in, and we going out? And so that we have a different kind of partnership, I think. And we can't have a partnership if we're speaking a jargon that nobody understands. I mean, that's okay. You should do that. I mean, there's some things that should be, there's some things that should be that nobody understands, and that's fine. That's, that's part of what the luxury of having a university means. 
and you go all the way as deep as you can. But there's some other things that we need to be able, you know, to, to, to communicate. I'm going to offer a gentle disruption. Please. And Thank you very much and please join us for the